Hey guys, Jackie here, and I just want to give you all an update before we start this video. Basically, this video is a redone version of my Puella Paji Madoka Magica review that I did uh, <laughs> quite many months back. I forget exactly when I did it, but let's just say that I didn't do a very good job on the video. I didn't exactly do a lot of analysis, and I didn't know what I was talking about in certain cases, which were crucial and not very good. Plus, I was kind of a kind of a closed-minded dick in them, and of course, my commenters uh, helped me realize that. With that being said, it moves on to my uh, next point. Um, I got quite a few comments for that. I will be addressing those right now because. Of course, I can take criticism now. Back then, I couldn't. And I've come to the realization that I'm going to have to do that with, you know, being professional and all that stuff. You know, so it's what video makers should be like. So I will be addressing them. Uh, Unarmed C Civilian says, Like Neon Genesis Evangelion, you have to look at the entire picture. Gen Urobochi, I hope I said that right, who was the writer of it, he is... He is misogynistic, and he hates good things. He wrote um, the anime in question to not only be more realistic, but also as a truth. Now, I kind of understand that the show needs a little bit more light to it, but there's a remind. But just as a reminder, there is a third movie, Rebellion, which I recommend to watch if you have not already. Which I definitely should, but I'm going to be focusing on the series as a whole in terms of how it goes for me. I'm going to address um, two more comments before we continue on with the actual thought, my actual thoughts of the thing, because um, I actually have a better understanding of it more. So, Lamented Musing says, Kyubei isn't evil, which I disagree. He, he is evil. He has no ability to be evil, nor does he hold any emotions. It's only programmed, per se, to stop the production of entropy and then countering it. Um, okay, that, that sentence makes sense. And I, I understood that part. Actually, now that I remember, as I rewatched it, I figured that part out. And thank you for bringing this up. And that's its purpose. It can't be evil. We see it as evil because we hold human emotions. It does not, however. Because we, we are human and we care about these characters. We find its actions to be evil. Well, I mostly didn't like most of the characters, but the long brown haired chick, uh, I forget her name, Akami or something like that, and then there was uh, that blue haired hit one, the one with the short blue hair, I liked her the most, but yeah, but anyway, moving on, because we are human and we care about these characters, we find his actions to be evil, Kyube is only doing good, is doing things towards the greater good, at least that what he feels is the greater good, well, in a sense it is, but yeah, it doesn't see a handful of lives as lost as big of a deal because it has no reason to. Realistically, a few lives being lost is a very small sacrifice to saving the entire universe from being destroyed. Okay, I understand that it needs magical energy that's, um, of course, what he uses the girls to get. But at the same time, they have a short lifespan and they die and they don't care how many lives it has to risk, which in this case is evil. I'm sorry, but it is. Also, Madoka Magica is supposed to be a more realistic portrayal of the magical girl genre. Well, yeah, a dark realistic portrayal, but whatever. The reason why magical girls fight these witch beings is because it creates a lot of emotional energy. I understand that. In the universe, that, Ma that Madoka Maja <laughs> in Madoka Magica's universe, uh, emotions hold a lot of energy. I understand that. that. That part makes sense, but... I still felt that it still had flaws regardless of what you're trying to tell me, no offense. And I will go over them each as I respond to the uh, video which I found. We'll get to that in a bit. The Cube species, the, the Cube species saw that bringing young girls to despair creates a huge energy response, right? And instead of creating villains, they reuse the magical girls. They recycle them. The more they recycle, the more energy they create. It's unlimited energy. To, to this alien species, this is the most effective way to counter entropy. Well, okay, that makes sense, but at the same time, it's still evil in a sense. So before you talk about, oh, it's for the sake of the plot, know that the show does explain everything and it all ties together. Regardless of what it explains, I just didn't care for it. 
And I will admit, at one point, I mentioned the fact that it's dark is an issue. Okay, I was wrong. What I meant... Okay. It's that... It's not that it's dark that it bothers me, but because it just doesn't handle its things together. I mean, that pink hair chick, whatever her name is, she's pretty annoying. I know that I could look up their names, but I don't really care because I don't like this anime. But I'm just basically being fair. I respect your opinion, though, regardless of the facts. Madoka Magica is a unique anime that kind of makes you realize your, your humanity and how it affects your moral code. Uh, in a sense, somewhat, but I didn't really feel that when watching the anime. I could analyze it and possibly see it, but I just don't really care for it. I mean... You, the way you look at the way you look at this anime, it, it I can understand why you would see it. I just don't personally see it. I respect this viewpoint. I just would rather watch or play something else. I'd rather play Persona, to be honest. The characters just interest me a whole lot more than that, and that's a video game. Hell, I'd even watch the anime as well. The, even though it's flawed, I would watch that over th this Madoka magic of bullshit. I'm sorry, I'm not changing my stance. I don't like it. And nothing you say is going to change my mind. Anyway, the antagonist, don't you mean antagonist, but whatever, it's not really an issue. I, I could make that mistake too. The antagonist of the show can be seen as the actual protagonist because of how it could hold human emotions and how it is helping for the greater good. If you just look, look at it from a glance and aren't really thinking and analyzing it, you would realize this. Don't things, take things at, at just face value. Right. I definitely understand what you're saying. It's just that it wasn't entertaining enough for me. I, I, I didn't care for it. I didn't like Kubey, regardless of what he was trying to do. I'm sorry. It's just... I, I didn't like it. But I will definitely go into more detail sooner or later. Don't put things into broad categories. That's how this anime is meant to be portrayed. I understand what you're saying, but... And I definitely should analyze things more. I'm really glad that I have helpful viewers like yourself who are willing to be able to point this out to me. Even if you like or hate me for what I have to say, all I can say is thank you all for commenting as well as your support and helping me realize some things. I like that. I like to learn things anyway. Mr. Bubblebox made a response to this saying that and he agrees with me, apparently, the saying that Cube is still a liar and malicious in, in, in intentions. Lies by omissions are still lies, and he's sentient enough to know that. Hell, Re Rebellion, which really meant Rebellion, but whatever, uh, pretty much says, it's, says that outright. The incubators are assholes, and it's not that they don't understand what they're doing. I mean, that's just another lie to get, to get what they want in the end. Well, obviously... Still, Kyubei is a complete and utter shitbag, but yeah, um, moving on to the actual video of PPMM. Okay, so, let me just close out a few things, and we will get started, everyone. Okay, I'm gonna make this big, and I will be pausing it at times to make my response to this, which is done by... Subsonic Particle, who is pretty good. I, I've seen this video before. I forgot to subscribe because I was so busy with getting the material for stuff and everything. So, um, yeah. Let's continue on. Yeah. Yeah, here goes nothing. Right. Studio Shaft was something that went under the radar studio during the late 90s and early 2000s, but slowly grew something of a cult following with the popularity of great shows such as Avatar and Memories, Sayonara Zetsubo Sensei, and Hidemori Sketch. The studio established a reputation I actually kind of want to see those. ...tation for the use of minimalist art and color design and unconventional cinematography, largely attributed to their head honcho, Aki Kishimbo. Most people will probably tell you, however, that the studio's first real smash hit was Baki in 2009. By fusing highbrow theming and imagery and presentation with lowbrow otaku-centric comedy, sexual artwork, and metaphors, the series managed to appeal to both niche consumers and mass-market penis bearers everywhere. The unbelievable success of this series may have been the catalyst that allowed Sharp's next big hit to have the incredible production it evidently needed. However, if you ask most people what the best show is by Sharp, if they don't say the Monogatari series, they will very likely answer 2011's Puella Magi Modica Magica. Okay, I like the video you're making here so far, and I love the research you've done. I need to do more research on some stuff, but yes, I can definitely see how this is going. Um... My only complaint, bro, is you talk way too fast. 
I'm serious. You could be... <laughs> imagine you... I can imagine you making a commercial with that. Some, some voice of that really fast narration. <laughs> it would definitely be good, but it, it would work for a commercial. So moving on. I'm not trying to get my channel raped by Aniplex, so enjoy the sight of video games and stills for the rest of the video. Even though the start of Mario Kart works to make everyone and everything seem as simple and unremarkable as possible, the viewer can somehow sense that something's not quite right. The bright, gorgeous, and peppy artwork and character designs are occasionally interspersed with bleak, sinister, and intimidating imagery. Which is actually done very well. The, the anime, for the most part, looks good, but the witches look like crap. Uh, that's just what I'm gonna say. The opening theme is equal parts high energy and dejected. The opening theme song is also extremely catchy. I love it. Exciting but melancholic. The show's excellent design only really becomes apparent when looked at with context, and this is doubly so when looking at the show's production. I'm pretty sure that most anime fans were wise enough to realize that Gen Rabuchi of Fate Stay Night fame wasn't going to write a normal ass Magical Girl show. I mean, who would? How many popular anime studios put all of their talent and money into a traditional Magical Girl show without some type of twist? Okay, I can understand he wanted to do something different, but... The show still has its flaws. I didn't like how the monsters looked and how the the plot played out. I just didn't care for it. Plus, Kyube doesn't really pay for the shit he's done. So, yeah, fuck this anime. I'm, I'm not changing my mind. I mean, regardless of what messages it may do, but if we look at it from that standpoint, yeah, fuck this anime. But I can definitely see how it can appeal to others, even though it will never appeal to me. In this day and age, the likes of revolutionary girl Utena and Princess Tutu got attention from anime fans with their subversive, self-aware theming and presentation. I've heard about those, but I'm not sure if I want to check them out. Okay, maybe the Utena one, but I don't know about Princess Tutu. Maybe. Which leads me to give my input on the whole deconstruction argument. Slowly but surely, more anime fans have been questioning the idea that Madoka Magica is truly a deconstruction of the magical girl genre, claiming that to state this is to believe the genre is much more insular than it actually is. And this I would half agree with, but I ultimately consider Madoka to be less of a deconstruction of the genre itself, but more the idea. And it achieves this by asking the fundamental question, what does it mean to be a magical girl? And therefore, what does it mean to be a magical girl anime? Rather than flipping the entire transforming girls genre on its head, Madoka is more concerned with the stylings of classical magical girl anime for kids, such as Sailor Moon, Cardcaptor Sakura, and Hotcat Freaky. And the sh I actually really like the bottom one. Oh, I could definitely see the inspiration there, definitely. But this one, I think I've heard about. Don't think I'll see it though, but this I don't like. This I do like. But, you know, it's wrong. Show at first presents itself in an identical structure. Madoka is a perfectly average girl who slowly gets wrapped up in an extraordinary set of circumstances. After she and her best friends are given the opportunity to become magical girls, she responds to this the same way any kid would in a show for children, sketching up costumes and thinking up catchphrases. But Makes sense. Relatable audience. I don't, ha I don't have an issue there. Um, having a relatable audience, yeah. Not considering what this actually means, it isn't until the infamous third episode that the series truly bears its fangs, and everyone begins to realize the gravity of their situation. And with that said, I'm officially going into spoiler territory, so if for whatever reason you haven't seen the show yet, go do it now. I already did. Are you gone yet? Okay, good. The death of Mommy was so massively impactful, not just by nature of a cast member dying, but because it happened in this show with this presentation. Yeah, I feel bad for her death too, I can definitely understand that. Madoka had built up a level of comfort and safety by this point. I like her the most. I'm just gonna say that. The red-haired chick is okay. Luckily, since Mommy was characterized as such a confident and motherly senpai. But more importantly, everyone reacts to the incident with the same level of trauma and terror that a real person would, and this feeling ripples throughout the rest of the series. A traditional Magical Girl series could have urgent or fatal situations, but very rarely would real- I've actually seen that anime. It was okay. ...world emotional investment, and that is Madoka Magical's calling card. One of the major themes in this series is juxtaposition. However, um, uh, that other one, uh, this anime, hold on, what was it called? This one? I forgot the name of it, but I know I've seen it. It's actually enjoyable. I like it a bit more, and it has some more emotional attach attachment, as well as some weirdness, but whatever. I can get behind this a bit more. I mean, I understand the themes it plays upon, but, you know, moving on. It's, I just like this better than Madoka Magica. Emotional investment and well, not PP, P, M, 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 P, 3 M. I, 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 what did I say? P, P, M, M. I meant, <sighs> wait a minute. I thought it was Puella Maji. Uh, Puella Paji. Oh my god, damn it. I messed up. <laughs> my bad. Whatever. I can laugh at my own mistakes. 
Puello Magi Madoka Magic. P3M. That's what I'll call it, not PPMM. At is Madoka Magica's cooling card. One of the major themes in this series is juxtaposition and subversion. Of both tropes and expectations, the reason the show's technical and yet subdued palette is so distinguished is because of how massively it conflicts with the show's tone and atmosphere. Speaking of which, Madoka Magica's production is incredible. Yes, it is. Using Shaft's awful design sense and attention to detail with some truly creative and diverse backgrounds and settings, the show's meticulous costume designs, high quality fight scenes, and transformation sequences. For the most part, the backgrounds and stuff are good, yes. Yes, we know. The animation's great. This remind me that despite all the red herring, the Madoka is still very faithful to many key aspects of the magical girl genre. The show's near future setting lends the series a very sleek and ergonomic quality, especially in regards to locations and architecture. And finally, the show has an excellent sense of scope and detailed shot composition to boost the grandiosity of the action and drama. I definitely consider it one of my favorite looking anime of all time. I think that there are plenty of anime that look a lot better, like Ayori Aoshi, but I like that a bit more, even though it's... Not a magical girl anime, but you know what I mean. And the reason I'm putting so much of an emphasis on this is because it's kind of a big deal. The show can communicate so much emotion and meaning just through its excellent use of tone and cinematography. Madoka Magica could be considered something of a psychological thriller, and being able to relate the tension and anguish that the characters are feeling to the audience using multiple staging and manipulation of psychology is what separates the good shows from the great. Madoka doesn't need gratuitous gore and screaming to be effective. You need to understand how the audience thinks to really get in their head and leave a lasting impression on them. And oh, of course. I understand that. It still doesn't appeal to me, but I can definitely understand that. Gen Rabucci has demonstrated a number of times now that he knows how to move the audience. Countless moments in the series left me in awe at how tightly crafted they were. In one scene, Madoka slyly discusses her lingering feeling of responsibility for Sayaka to her mother over a drink. At this point, yeah, that's her name, Sayaka. But I, un I understand what you're saying. Continue. Point, we've seen enough conflict and hurt feelings that this quiet, low-tempo scene between a mother and daughter probably shouldn't have been anything special. But it's all made special by such perfect presentation, such fantastic chemistry between the characters, such phenomenal sound design, sold by subtle and emotional voice performances. It immediately cemented itself as one of my favorite scenes in the show. And this Miyazaki especially captured that very well, and other studios that have been that have worked with Studio Ghibli as well as Studio Ghibli in general. I hope I spelled that pronounce that right. Ghibli, Ghibli. It's it's awesome. This level of meticulous attention to detail and craftsmanship permeate throughout virtually every aspect of Madoka Magica's design. Madoka and her mother have clearly established an impenetrable level of trust and respect, which ends up paying off in a big way towards the end of the story. The genius of Madoka Magica's world building is how it at first coasts off traditional magical girl cliches, fighting evil witches in the name of love and peace. However, just like the show's characterization, it then creatively applies this to a harsher real world setting. Much of the show's lore can be taken as an extended analogy. The witches represent depression, the more learned into a witch's control that a person becomes, the more lifeless and stoic they appear to the outside world. Okay, you have a point there. I mean, okay, some witches look cool, but most of them, like, I didn't care for their designs, but I've seen a bit better. It's just my opinion. I think personas were designed better, but that, that that's just my opinion. It's still, it's impressive. Just not impressive to me. Death's calls into witches' labyrinth, which are fantastically animated by the way, are staged to look like suicides to bystanders, giving the story a distinct psychological edge. The magical girls fight the witches, but in turn harbor the stress and emotional turmoil of the witches themselves, in the form of depression. And once this becomes more than the girls can handle, they become witches. In other words, their biggest enemy is time, as their fates were sealed from the second they entered the contract with Kyubei. To combat this, magical girls need to take energy from the witches in order to sustain themselves and keep their soul gems clear, adding a level of selfishness and self-serving to their actions. At of course, even though they're used to get energy but yes and they can all and of course they're on a time limit their their lives are on a timer i get that it's just that that aspect even though it's dark and it makes sense from for a psychological thriller for a psychological thriller madoka magica is definitely good i just don't particularly care for it because of how things played out it has ideas that in a sense, have gar have worked for quite a lot of people. I can see the fandom is definitely strong with this one. I'm just n n cannot really get behind it because I don't find it appealing. But I can understand how it's appealing to others.
As a magical girl, it was impossible to survive without taking as much as you give, which leads to the whole entropy reveal that Kyubei had been working towards. This results in foolish, lonely magical girls in the case of Mami, and cruel, systematic magical girls in the case of Kyoko. The reason it is impossible to reach Wait, hold on, hold on. on. Towards. This results in Let me the rewind. to keep their soul gems clear, adding a level of selfishness and self-serving to their actions. As a magical girl, it is impossible to survive without taking as much as you give, which leads to the whole entropy reveal that Kyubei had been working towards. This results in foolish, lonely magical girls in the case of Mami, and cruel, systematic magical girls in the case of Kyoko. The reason it is impossible to reach any degree of stability in this state is because the system is inherently broken, not devised in a way that logically provides the magical girls with a worthy fate, a fact which only one of the girls manages to recognize. Hope and despair are another major theme in Madoka Magical, playing a pivotal role in every character's actions and motivations. Sayaka desperately hopes that she didn't make her decision to become a magical girl selfishly, and this hope is the only thing that sustains her over the course of the show. In making the wish that kicked off her contract, Sayaka was told by Mami not to make wishes for other people, suggesting that it would really be a wish in her own best interests. Sayaka decides to heal the boy she has a crush on, and for a while it seems that things are going to work out for her. However, we quickly realize that Sayaka is not a person that can work single-mindedly for others, nor is she anywhere near strong enough to shoulder the weight of her responsibilities. When she finds out another friend is making advances towards the guy she risked everything for, it slowly dawns on her that she made her wish entirely for herself, just as Mami warned her. With each new revelation from QB and each new run-in with seemingly evil magical girls, she slowly loses faith that anything she does has any meaning. The only thing holding her together is the hope that maybe she can do some good. The straw that broke the camel's soul gem ends up being her witnessing some douchebags talking badly about their girlfriends, and in a very Shinji Akari moment, succumbs to the feeling that this was the humanity that she was fighting for, which ends up being more than she can take, finally giving to the despair that had been festering inside of her. I guess you could say, since I don't like Evangelion very much, because of its psychological stuff and other themes that it ties in, I don't particularly like this one. I guess you could say this type of anime, a, I mean this anime as well as Evangelion, have themes can, that in a sense works for some people. I just don't particularly like it, regardless of how much I analyze it, because it feels like it's going too deep. I don't know, it's not my thing. Mami Tomoe has banked her ability to fight on the hope that what she is doing is noble and just, donning a sweet and comforting demeanor thinly veiled over a profound sense of loneliness and isolation. The genius of Mami's design is once again something that can only be appreciated in retrospect, unlike her character design which is gorgeous from episode 1. The viewer okay, it works for others, it just doesn't work for me because I think that regardless of what it tries to do, I think it gets in the, regardless of what ideas it throws in front of you at the viewers in general, it basically does way too much. It tries way too hard to be different and unique, which is a good thing, but sometimes it's also a bad thing. I think that these newer elements that they throw in get in the way of the story in a sense. Some people argue that it adds on to the story. I just don't see the appeal of the story. Honestly knows nothing about this character at her first glance, let alone how horribly delusional she is. Homura struggles to even look her in the eye. This magical girl is so blissfully ignorant of the fact she's thrown her humanity away that she's actually seeking recruits. An alternate timeline reveals that Mami may have actually been the least capable of dealing with this knowledge. Mami actually has more lingering presence and impact on the narrative after her death, being the embodiment of the idea that magical girls aren't heroes but rather sacrifices. Kyoko Sakura is interesting because- Oh yeah, she is. Ky Kyoko, that was her name. Right, I remember her. Unlike the other characters, the means by which she sustains herself is by taking comfort in her lack of hope. Having seen the worst of humanity and lost her family due to her abilities, she's one of the characters that understands best that she is cursed rather than blessed. I, I'm glad that she understands that, but at the same time, you know, still, <laughs> I guess you could say, has themes that I still think that regardless of what it does, and regardless of how cool certain things are about it, like its action scenes, animation, and some characters, I just don't care for it, but you know. As a result, she's completely disillusioned by the start of the series and treats both her enemies and competition with equal levels of vitriol. This systematic approach to her work almost suggests that she embraces her lack of humanity as a means of maintaining her sanity, which understandably makes her appear evil to Modoka and Sayaka. Watching Sayaka prance around with all the energy, drive, and ignorance of a newly minted magical girl is not only frustrating to Kyoko, but somewhat intimidating. I could definitely understand that. I'm glad they have the good chemistry there. I mean, well, negative chemistry, but their dislike, I guess, in a sense, rivalry towards each other. I, b I believe it's rivalry. I don't know, I forget. But I know that they don't like each other. 
and eventually yeah. inspiring. After all, the last thing she wants to be is emotionally invested, but that's exactly what happens. Homura Akime is Wait, hold on. Most Say that again? ...into Kyoko, but somewhat intimidating, and eventually inspiring. After all, the last thing she wants to be is emotionally invested, but that's exactly what happens. Homura Akime is possibly the most interesting character, as her- Akime, yeah. Faith in her mission is the thing that perpetuates the cycle leading into the events of the series. Homura's one goal is to stop Madoka from making a contract with Kyubei and prevent her from signing her life away to a horrific fate. I actually like her the most because she's trying to stop her from being, you know, a magical girl in general. But, you know, that's just my opinion. Regardless of what Kyubei wants, fuck Kyubei. I'm siding with Akime. Homura has lived the same scenarios over and over. I hope I spelled her- I hope I pronounced her name right. Over again, using her time manipulation abilities to restart the cycle every time Madoka concedes and is eventually killed. With each time repeat, the more disaffected Homura becomes to people around her, which she does for a practical reason. Homura is the only character that strategically manages the quality of her soul gem, being well aware that if her hope in her mission wavers, she will become a witch. Episode 11 is completely dedicated to showing us all of the harrowing experiences that have led to the Homura we see throughout the series. Discovering Homura's motivations in this episode totally recontextualizes her actions earlier in the show, reminding the viewer just how little we knew about these characters going in. However, the more time she forces the magical loss to start over, the more powerful Madoka becomes, putting her abilities in a level far beyond anything the Incubators ever could have predicted. This revelation, delivered by Kyubei, makes Homura incapable of carrying on, completely losing hope in the idea that what she was doing was helping Madoka. Also, let me just say that Kyubei is one of the most genius character concepts I've ever seen. Well, the fact that he connives them and such, especially with how cute he looks, he's in a sense and actually a very good villain. I just hate him just as much as I like him. He exists as something of a living embodiment of some of the show's most central themes, namely juxtaposition, for obvious reasons. Kyubei has the incredible power of turning you against others and yourself just through his speech alone, and is made so much more jarring and intimidating by his legendary vocal performance. There is one scene in which he tries to explain his motivations in a way that Madoka understands, outright horrifying her with his torturous and cruel philosophies and worldview. There's even a few instances of psychological rape. It's impossible for me not to appreciate how carefully written and executed this scene is, and it may be the moment of the show that best represents Kyubei's true manipulative nature. Genrobuchi liking Kyubei's state of mind to Arcade and bringing down the Twin Towers. He is incapable of understanding how what he is doing is anything but efficient, and just can't comprehend the ideals of humanity. Even though she's Which I understand that he can't comprehend those ideals at all. No, I'm glad- I understand that he can't, because he's a different being. He doesn't understand. He's from another world. But at the same time... Basically, he's- the best way to describe Kyubei is he's liked as- as much as he is- he is hated. He's very manipulative, and that in a sense is actually quite clever when dealing with certain people that, in a sense, can be seen as easy targets. Like her. Madoka, I believe? Madoka? Yeah, Madoka. Or Madoka, whatever. She doesn't know how to vocalize it, Madoka knows that what's happening is wrong, and Kyubei fails to sway her, which leads to an analysis of the relationship between Hope and Madoka, or rather that Madoka is Hope. Madoka Kaname has displayed strength of virtue far stronger than any of the characters from the very beginning. Regardless of the politics, she can innately feel that it is wrong for magical girls to be fighting one another, and the more she learns, the more resolute she becomes. Madoka has the firm moral backbone that Sayaka wishes she had, and maintains- Well, in terms of being firm, She's also a huge crybaby, which in a sense makes her generally pretty flawed, a lot more flawed than strong, but whatever. It's a constant level of responsibility for the magical girls. No matter how many times Homeworld warns her not to get involved, she cannot accept it. She's stubborn, in a sense, and I like that aspect, but at the same time, I also don't, because clearly Kyubei is evil. Some people say he's not. He just doesn't believe he's evil. He believes what he's doing and his goals and philosophies aren't evil. But whatever. He's not evil, apparently, even though he's clearly <laughs> leading people to sacrifice their own lives to get entropy. Monica is uncompromising in her ideals and never for a moment believed that anything good could come of violence and cruelty. She wants to save the magical girls, and upon realizing that it's impossible without the current system, she vows to destroy it. She will bring down every rule and rewrite every rule that stands in her way. Monica achieves her potential and realizes her destiny by becoming a god. What Homura was really fighting with Monica's destiny, once again giving an underlying selfishness to her actions. What Homura sees as a sacrifice, Monica sees in an affirmation. She ultimately evolves into a being transcending time, space, and matter, and perpetually defeating witches and existing as a concept. Which is a bit too weird for me, but whatever. Let's roll with it. I know I remember it explaining that. It's just... To me, I thought it was a bit too strange. 
but then again, you know, magical girls are tend to be strange, but I've just... That part just really went over my head, even though it's true. While Marika speaks to Homura, she does so with a calm, comforting, almost meditative equanimity, giving us complete confidence that she knows what she's doing and is happy with it. And with that, the show ends, reminding the viewer that no matter what you are feeling, Marika is fighting for you. One of the most important reasons that Marika Magica is one of my favorite anime is similar to Gurren Lagann. It feels like a legend being relayed to the viewer, completely the perfect- I like Gurren Lagann a bit better because it appeals to me more. It's probably because it's a mecha anime, but I, I don't know. Or it's probably because I like the characters more and the outcome for them works best for me, but that's pretty much the only thing I can really say, but yeah, I prefer this over that, but that's just my opinion. And logical conclusion, a timeless tale with a simple message presented so brilliantly that it takes on several new layers of meaning. I've heard a few people say that despite working fantastically within the context of the series, the cast definitely wouldn't be strong enough to carry a more character-driven series. And while I kind of agree with this, I wouldn't hold that against them whatsoever. Each character in this series to me is a piece of the puzzle, a moving cog in a larger mechanism. Yes, to a... I guess you could say a poorly written plot, but that's just my opinion. To me, I think the story sucks. Because I don't like what happens, and find it to be a bit too strange and weird and hard to get behind particularly because it's not my type of show but i was giving my best to really give it more thought but i just couldn't it's not my kind of anime i'm, I'm sorry if that pisses off some people but that's my opinion of puella maji madoka magica i don't like what happened in it didn't like how things played out it wasn't my thing so yeah. They will serve their role in the show's narrative fantastically and have so many layers that every time I watch this series I'm giving new things to think about. I wouldn't say that any of them individually are among my favorites in anime, but as a unit they're definitely among my favorite casts. With that said, I don't think I can name them one- I'd have to say that based on what I've seen so far of the show, I've seen every episode, it's just been quite a, a long time since I did see it because I remember not liking it at all. But it had some impressive moments, like you said. But regardless of how impressive it may be, I'm not liking it as a whole. If you guys like it, that's perfectly fine. But I just couldn't get behind it. I didn't, even though it's dark and such, it's not because it's dark, it's because of what, what it truly does with its dark ideas and such. It's unique ones too, but it's just like a bent fork. Just because you're unique doesn't mean you are good. But that's only me talking. I'm sorry if I come off as a bit too cynical, but yeah, that's just my two cents. The costs. With that said, I don't think I can name in one core series so phenomenally dense and rich with things to enjoy and appreciate. I've watched this series twice, and on the second sitting, I remembered virtually every scene, since every episode is so crammed with memorable lines, set pieces, and meaningful interactions. I can safely say that no matter how many times I've watched this thing, I could never find it enjoyable overall. I mean, I can see how it appeals to others, but I just don't like this type of show. Or what it does, I just really hate it. It's all highlighted by a beautiful soundtrack and consistently high quality animation. For the most part, it's good, yeah. With all things considered, Paula Magi and Monica Magica is one of my all time favorite anime experiences, and definitely my favorite show after show. I keep jumping between this and Psycho Pass, my favorite work by Game but right now I'm kind of feeling inclined to this. Anyway, since the show. I'm more interested in Psycho Pass, but, you know, I just want to see how it utilizes its ideas, and I may end up actually covering that when I get around to it, but yeah. Um, for me, this is more of a 4.5 out of 10, but that's just my opinion. It's so well known, everybody seems to have an opinion or interpretation of it, so be sure to share those in the comments so we can all bicker about cartoons at like the fine schools we are. Okay. So, that's pretty much it. He has some really good points because he has more patience for this type of thing. Me... I find it hard to have patience for this anime, but no matter what it did, I just really fucking hated it. However, that is only my opinion. I accept the fact that there are those who do like it. If you like Puella Maji Madoka Magica, if you like this anime or whatnot, then you should definitely continue watching it and liking it. I accept that entirely. However, I myself have the exact opposite reaction. Thank you all for tuning in, and I'll see you all in the next videos. Stay batty, my friends.